So we're here at SHOT Show 2017, Long Range Shooters of Utah, and we had to stop by and see the legend, the man, John Krieger, Krieger Barrels. So I wanted to come by and ask John, I've seen a few interviews in the past that other people have done asking specifically questions that I see a lot on Facebook and Instagram, uh, and also on YouTube comments asking about cleaning of barrels and proper break-in. I know he has some uh, some philosophies of his own that I'd love to hear and share with you guys. I've actually shared this video the other guy made many times, and I want to make my own finally, specifically addressing these questions. So John, first of all, um, thank you for making an amazing product. Uh, I'm, I feel honored just to be standing here with you. Um, tell us a little bit about, um, uh, for instance, a break-in procedure. So somebody buys one of your match-grade barrels, what is your recommendation for breaking in that barrel, or is there a break-in process that you recommend at all? Yeah, it, well, there's a, uh, I don't pay much attention personally to breaking in the barrels. So I've never felt the need for it. But what does happen with a premium barrel that's finished lap like ours or open wires, the uh, little just uh, whatever, the lay of the finish is all in the direction of the bullet travel. So when you're shooting, the bullet is not doing much to the bore and groove of the barrel. But what's happening when the uh, barrel is chambered, the reaming marks in the throat are unavoidably across the direction of the bullet travel. It's like a fine file, you might say. It's uh, right across the direction of the bullet travel. You're, you're firing around, you've got gases that are 40, uh, 4,500, 5,500 degrees temperature, 50, 60,000 PSI, it's like a plasma. And it melts that dust, let's say, and uh, carries it down the barrel. But as the bullet goes on the barrel, the gas expands and cools, and the copper comes out and plate, more or less plates itself on the barrel. At subsequent rounds, of course, going over that just adds to it and makes it look like the bore and the groove are really the problem, but it's not, it's the back in the throat. So when you're breaking in the barrel, what you're really doing is polishing out that roughness in the throat from the reaming operation, chambering operation, without allowing the, the uh, copper to build up. And I don't have any fixed road method or way of doing that. I let the barrel tell me. I use a, a, a pneumonia-based cleaner like, like CR10 or Sweets. Uh, and I watched the color. Uh, color if the, those stainless barrels, in my uh, experience, have been virtually no different from the first shot to 20th or whatever. But uh, chrome is a little bit different. It has a little bit more of an affinity for the copper. It's a little bit more abrasion resistant. It takes a little bit longer or whatever. But I just watched the color and let, it, uh, let that tell me. If it's a really rich, you know, that green-blue color, um, keep going. You know, keep firing a couple rounds and cleaning a couple rounds and cleaning. I'm not saying that if you never, you know, if you just fired 50 rounds in a while of cleaning, that you'd ruin the barrel. You just would be, you'd have quite a cleaning job maybe, but uh, uh, that's essentially what I feel is going on inside the barrel when you're breaking it in. So, so you don't recommend any particular kind of process for breaking it in, just get out there and shoot it? Yeah, I don't see any reason to do a road process. Barrels are different, they're like people, and so some may require a little bit more cleaning than another one will. And I believe it's, you know, the, the steel itself is not 100% homogenous and uniform throughout its length. It's chemistry, machinability and stuff varies a little bit. The, you can, we can hear it when we're drilling. And I think that it depends upon what the chemistry is in a certain part of the barrel, whether it's going to pick up a little bit more copper, a little bit less. The re one of the reasons I, I think that or uh, verification for that theory is that the chrome molly, which is a different chemistry, has, has a little bit more of an affinity for picking up copper than what the stainless does. So I, I do believe the chemistry plays a part in it. And your barrels are, are they exclusively stainless or do you have any chromoly off? Oh yeah, we do both. Okay, yeah, we what do. is more popular typically? By far the stainless. But we also make uh, bigger big bore barrels like 416 Rigby, 577 Nitro and things like that. And since those are normally classical type rifles, they're generally the chromoly, the, the type you can blue. Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah. So as far as a regular cleaning process, I know that's probably going to vary a little bit depending on how you run the rifle. If you're hunting and only firing a few rounds every you know, couple of months at most versus somebody who's running, you know, like a PRS shooter who's running rounds really quickly through to shoot a moving target or something at an unlimited round stage. What, what is your rule of thumb when it comes to cleaning or what do you recommend typically for, for clients both that aren't shooting a lot and then those that are shooting a lot and doing it quickly? My, firstly, I, I feel the less cleaning you do, the better. It's not a benign operation. Uh, particularly on the smaller bores and the rim fires in particular, 
uh, it's a it, you can damage the barrel cleaning it too much, I think, especially if you're not using a good rod guide. And I don't like to see stuff dragged back across the muzzle, uh, degrading the crown. A lot of people feel that a, you know the crown is not important. I I've always felt that it is, but um, I ba again I basically don't have a road procedure. I let the barrel tell me what it was. Some hardly need anything at all. Some need a little bit more. Uh, when the gun stops shooting, it, you know, <laughs> that, that's a good time to clean it. Time to start cleaning. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. One of the things, too, has got really nothing to do with what we're talking about, but it's something that I uh, was thinking about at the show. Somebody had mentioned to me how you know, a light barrel, you fire a couple, two, three, four shots in it, and, and it, the group starts to open up. That's what, and they, they feel that this, the barrel is walking and uh, uh, whatever, you know, something like that. And I, I don't think that's the case. What I think it is, is the light barrels, they, the heat comes off of them so, so rapidly. They have so much heat mirage coming off of the barrel that's actually distorting your sight picture. And, and the way to prove that, I've done it for myself, is lay the rifle in the sandbags, or the hot barrel, lay it in the sandbags, look through the scope at the target. You'll see the thing dancing around. Well, which one do you shoot at? That, that's where I think the, the why it opens Interesting. up. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, we have a, a friend that shoots a 375 shy tack of a desert tack, and it's if you look at it, it seems like a heavy barrel, but not for a 375 shy tack. Yeah, they've uh, told us in the past that once they get you know five, ten rounds through it, then it starts to kind of go all over. But that's an interesting, uh, interesting thought that it could just be that mirage. Yeah, but even the heavy barrels do. Um, yeah. Because, you know, look at the bench press shooters and across the course shooters. I shot competitively for years, and we always used a mirage band on the barrel to, to get the heat to come off to the side so it didn't distort the sight picture. So even the heavy barrels will, particularly when you're shooting more than three shots, you know. Okay. But, I'm, I'm curious to ask you, um, as far as barrel length, um, I know shorter barrels tend to be stiffer, mm -hmm. have less harmonic uh, flex to them. Um, what's your thoughts on, uh, you know, is a shorter barrel more accurate? Or is there a sweet spot in there that you would typically recommend barrel length-wise for a typical shooter? Yeah, there probably is a sweet spot, uh, which is one of the reasons why these tuners work to some degree, I think. I don't know how you would determine other than just plain shooting and, and uh, shortening a barrel. I remember one time when I rebarreled my cross-the-course rifle, it's a 40X 308, and shot it, went to the range and shot it after I barreled it. And it, it didn't seem to shoot as, it shot good, but not as good as I thought it should. So I went back and I, they faced off maybe, I don't know, 50 or 100 thousandths and recrowned that went back. Still was kind of mediocre, did it again, and all of a sudden, wham, it just came right in. Now, that could have been a lot of things, you know, not just cutting off you know, maybe 100 thousandths of the barrel and recrowning it, but yeah, there's, it's hard to say. You know, the vibration is something you, nobody's really dealt with much and something I'd like to, just haven't had the time to do it. But uh, the old theory too that the German uh, eight millimeter Mauser, that type of thing, that had the steps on the barrels. The theory was that that was certain harmonics that uh, when they stepped it down at a certain point, that was a, there was a reason for doing it. But nobody's ever proven that that's the case. But I thought it would be kind of interesting to try to try to try it out. Shorter barrels are stiffer. The longer barrels, maybe you're going to have more whip, but you also have more barrel time with them. I mean, it's just milliseconds or nanoseconds or whatever. Yeah. But it's, it is short, you know, longer barrel time. If it, with iron sights, of course, that's a big advantage, the longer the sight radius is, but the scope kind of you know, is relatively meaningless. But. Gotcha. Um, one other question I had was, um, uh, as far as um, barrel life, uh, for say a 308 versus a 6 millimeter versus a 6.5, I'm curious to hear what your estimated barrel life would be on those, or what you've seen, or even a, a spread or a variance between somebody that shoots not a lot versus somebody that shoots a lot like a PRS shooter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, a lot of that oftentimes comes into the chemistry of the barrel at a certain point. I have a customer in California, the whole family's distinct, shot distinguished, you know, got the distinguished medal and so forth, and uh, they, they had shot M1As at that point in time, that's 308, and one, this particular man's rifle, one of them went over 12,000 rounds, and then, then he had another one that only went about 33 or 3,500 rounds. Uh, the only difference can be, well, there's a lot of things, if it's a different powder, different, you know, anything different could change that, that equation, but I think it's the chemistry business. Roughly, we, we usually figure about uh, at least 5,000 rounds on a, a 223 or a, a 308 or something like that, you know, not a real high-intensity cartridge. The bigger, you know, magnums or whatever, the life is going to be shorter. 
you have to define too what what you're talking about as far as the type of rifle it is. For example, a thousand yard uh, target rifle in a in a magnum a hot magnum uh, might have a life of 10 to 1500 rounds because. And what will happen is you'll start seeing elevation shots that you can't account for. But you could take that same gun at 200 yards or 100 yards and it'll shoot a little notch. So it depends upon where you're going to shoot it, what you're going to use it for and so forth, when something is shot out or not. But the basic rule of thumb is the more powder behind the, you know, the smallest hole, the worse it's going to be for barrel life. Um, sometimes barrel can you, there's a lot of people equate the barrel life to how far out they have to seat the bullet to touch the lands, and I don't think that's necessarily a good way to determine a barrel rifle. The best way is to shoot it and see if it's still shooting. I've, I've had personal, my personal rifles already, some of them had one of my varmint rifles, for example, it was about a third of the way down the barrel, you could hardly see any rifling in the thing. And it still shot uh, good enough for, for, prout, for varmint hunting, but it would start to shed jackets maybe about 50, 60 rounds because the copper was building up on it was so rough. It was still shot. If we were shooting somewhere where you could be cleaning all the time, it would be okay. But if you're half a mile or a mile from the truck, you know, only shot 50 rounds, you don't want to be walking back. So that barrel was shot out as far as, you know, as far as our purposes. But um, that's pretty much what I feel about it. What do you typically see out of like a six millimeter, like a 243? How many rounds would you typically expect to see through a, a precision rifle, a PRS shooter's barrel before that's going to go south and need to be replaced? Well, yeah, that's a very good question. The 243 is absolutely notorious for bad barrel life. Uh, there's a number of reasons for it, but the main thing seems to be the angle of the shoulder and an extremely short neck that it has. Uh, it basically is funneling all the powder, and it's, which is very abrasive at the point that it's coming out of the throat. It's not all burned yet. It's not a gas. It's, it's a lot of gas and material or whatever is blasting into the throat. They're very short. Uh, the, the barrel life. Again, it, yeah. Again, it depends on what you're using it for. But sure. interesting thing. Uh, one of the one of the scientists at H.P. White Laboratory, their national lab for uh, ammunition testing, pressure testing, and things like that. Uh, forensics, maybe. Um, one of the one of the uh, lab technicians there told me one time that the, the 300 Weatherby they get longer barrel life than they do on a lot of the shorter 30 caliber cartridges, and they feel the reason is not necessarily those those nice radiuses that the throat uh, the shoulder has, but the fact that it's got a very long neck, so that the gases instead of coming like the 243 does right into the throat, that they they actually are straightened out or uh, more directed down the barrel instead of at the side of the barrel so much. It's not so focused right there on the edges of the throat, but actually going more. Yeah, it's down more the with the bore instead of blasting into the side so of like it. Like a six, like if you neck the six five forty seven down to a six, it probably because it's got a nice long neck on it, would probably possibly enhance your barrel. Yeah, up. right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan of the 6547. Uh, one last question, and we'll uh, we'll let Mike's arms rest. Um, what? Uh, <laughs> What would you say, uh, or, or, tell me about the, the way that you cut your barrels. Is it button cut? Is it, how, how do you guys do the process? Well, there, there isn't any such thing as button cutting. Uh, 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 buttoning does not remove any metal. It's a swaging process. It was, uh, the button looks like somewhat like a fired bullet. It's got the grooves in it that it that would normally come into the lands. Uh, a bullet would be, a bullet would, the grooves would be formed in a bullet by the lands. So this, this space in the button forms the lands when it's pressed through or pulled through. It swages the material, sets up a lot of stress in the barrel, which then has to be stress relieved. Cut rifling, uh, we take out about a tenth or a tenth and a half of a thousandth per pass, which is about about one thirtieth or one fortieth the thickness of a piece of paper. So it takes hundreds of passes to rifle the barrel. It actually cuts and removes the material. It doesn't set up any stress in the process. It, uh, it was one of the reasons I, I, I like to cut rifling. I think we were talking before about the chemistry of the steel and the things varying through it, uh, uh, machine ability and hardness and whatever. The fact that the cut rifling takes off such an extremely light cut, it's a lot less sensitive to these variations, so the twist stays much more uniform. Whereas with a button, uh, buttoning a barrel, everything is done at once. It has, and it's very sensitive to variations in the, in the steel. Um, is one of, again one of the reasons why I do it, but not to knock button rifle barrels. They're you know they they've missed at many records. They're very good barrels. It's just a, a different uh, 
theory or whatever on you know how you want to make the barrel. You know, <clears throat> I just chose this because I there's all, all all the ways of rifling a barrel will make a good barrel, but it, there's always trade-offs. So and actually, the only trade-off in the cut rifling is how long it takes. The button barrel is a couple of minutes, four to four. The cut rifling is an hour on up. Uh, so the, the negative for cut rifling is on me. It takes longer to make it, uh, but there's no there's no negative as far as the barrel goes. The other thing that's nice about cut rifling is we can take the barrel like this, just a straight blank. We we pre-contour the barrel. We can turn it ahead of time. Whereas with a button rifle barrel, it has to stay a uniform cylinder because it has to resist the button the same. Um, we we pre-contour this barrel and then drill it and then pick up the center to make sure it's concentric and finish turn it afterwards. So all the severe machining is done before we ever get to the uh, critical inside dimensions. It's another thing I really like about cut rifling. Very cool. John, I really appreciate your time, sir. Oh, well, thanks for stopping. You. Appreciate and, it. Uh, thanks for coming out and giving us a few minutes today. You bet. All right, guys, thanks. So here we are at SHOT Show 2016. Got Todd McGee from Dead Air Armament. Hi, I'm Kelly McMillan here. We're going to give it a shot right now. 